The reading is from Acts 16, 6 through 15. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Mycenae, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by. So they passed by. Yeah. When they came to the border of Mycenae, they tried to enter Bithynia. Sorry about that. But the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Mycenae and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, he got ready at once to leave for Macedonia concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Samothrace, and the next day we went to Neapolis. But from there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony, and the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. So as I read uh, Acts 16 again this week and prepare for this morning, and, and really as we've been reading through Acts uh, throughout this entire season, studying this book and considering uh, how, how's the Spirit calling us to, to kind of reimagine church and faith and life, a, a quote came to mind by the late poet Mary Oliver, who once wrote, it must be a great disappointment to God if we are not dazzled at least 10 times a day. I love that quote. And I think that was the experience of the early church and certainly of the early missionaries of the church, that they must have been dazzled, amazed, shot at what the Holy Spirit was doing in their midst, not just 10 times a day, but, but always, because the Holy Spirit was guiding them, uh, moving them, even stopping them in their tracks at times. At least that was Paul's experience at the beginning of his second missionary journey. If you remember from last week, the early church had a moment of division on how to, to reconcile what the Holy Spirit was doing among the Gentiles. And so the early church leaders called a gathering, a council in Jerusalem, to try to discern the way forward. And what I left out of last week's message about uh, Acts 15 is that it doesn't really end in complete unity. I kind of left that out because it didn't really work with my message last week. But what happened at the very end of Acts 15, if you continue to read, is that there was a bit of a disagreement. So Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with them on their missionary journey, but Paul instead wanted to take Silas and those disagreements, and they parted ways. Paul and Silas picked up Timothy and apparently a guy by the name of Luke. And you notice in this reading in Acts chapter 16 how the pronouns are changed in this reading. Did anybody pick up on that? When they came to the border of Mysia, they entered, tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. And it shifts. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready. Did you notice that shift? We got ready to leave uh, for, at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So now it's a team of missionaries, Paul, Silas, Timothy, and it includes the narrator of the story, the gospel writer, Luke. And while the missionaries seem to have um, an itinerary for their missionary journey, God God has some other plans. In verses 6 and 7, as we heard read this morning, the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to enter into the province of Asia. 
I don't think it's that much of a stretch for us to, to make a connection here with, with Paul and his companions of being stopped in their tracks before they move forward to a certain place. Because how often do we, do we make a plan? How often do we um, have a, 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 an itinerary, a journey laid out before us that just takes a turn? So I've heard the saying before that we make plans and God just laughs, right? That doesn't mean that we shouldn't make plans or, or have goals or set an itinerary or a journey. But I think the invitation is to lay out all those plans before the Holy Spirit. Recognizing that while we might feel led to go to, to Asia to preach, God might be calling us to go to Macedonia. And so as we continue in the story, the missionaries are kind of stalled out in a place called Troas. Uh, what's next, they wonder. How might God be calling us uh, to, to go, to move? Which way should we, should we lead? That's when direction comes to Paul through a vision. According to verse 9, as we heard this morning, a man from Macedonia stands before Paul, begging him to come and help them, and he receives this in a vision. And it's interesting to know how Paul and his companions were, were open to the surprise moves of God and the Holy Spirit in their midst. Because you know, they could have just chosen to ignore it, right? They could have chosen to ignore the, the detour signs and press forward toward Asia. Paul could have brushed off the vision that he received that night as kind of a weird and bad dream, but they didn't ignore it. And in fact, they, they took that as confirmation of God's presence and activity in their lives. It was a part of their discernment of where God was calling them to move next. And they discerned it was the way to go, the concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. But again, I still go back to that change in language. Again, you know, that, that, that change from they were called to go and we were called to go. And again, I do think the narrator was included in this, that, that Luke was in on this journey, but, but I wonder if the invitation here is broader. It's almost as if the Acts writer invites Christians of all times and places into the story, into the missionary experience, that maybe we're all called to join Paul, the companions, Luke, all of them in this journey of missionary work. And perhaps our main goal, our first goal in sharing the gospel is to be dazzled by God ourselves, to be surprised by God and what God can do in our midst. Yes, we're, we're invited to share the good news of the love of Jesus Christ in word and deed. That is certainly true, but, but maybe our first and most important calling is to be surprised and dazzled ourselves. So our first stop, our first stop, in the surprising journeys in this uh, Macedonian city known as Phil, uh, Philippi, where Paul and his companions find the local place of prayer. Now, we might expect to find them in a, in a place like a Jewish synagogue or something of that nature, but there wasn't one in this Roman colony or, or village of Philippi. Instead, it's kind of a surprise to find people gathered at the riverside, mostly women, in prayer. And another surprise in this journey is the transformation of the Pharisee Paul, who went to talk to these women, including Lydia, who is a merchant of purple cloth. Again, don't be surprised where we find God moving and acting, leading us to places we wouldn't always expect, just like what happened with Paul. Because Paul, again, as we have already seen in Acts, breaks down barriers, includes others into this gospel message, and here in this story, even baptizes the entire family of Lydia and stays in her home. Lydia's heart is open to God's message that Paul is offering. And really, it's all about the work of the Holy Spirit in her midst. And it's good to pause here and note that this is a, a, what we call provenient grace. 
the grace of God that goes before us and within us, before we even recognize God's activity and presence in our lives, God's grace is always there. And that's what happened with Lydia in this story. Through the Holy Spirit, she is prepared for and open to Paul's message of the gospel. It's through the presence and activity of the Holy Spirit that Lydia gives birth to this church in Philippi. She opens her home, not only to these missionaries, but to the formation of this very church. It's likely that after the the missionaries left, because you know, they're, they're missionaries, right? And they had a journey to go on. They had to keep moving. They were itinerant. But but who was going to be there? Lydia, right? And it's likely that she would have continued to offer hospitality and and that she would continue to offer some form of organization and maybe even pastoral care for the life of First Church Philippi. I believe when we allow ourselves to be surprised and dazzled by God, we'll find joy. And that's what we find in Lydia's church in Philippi. So as Chris uh, mentioned uh, just a few moments ago, do you remember what our soul training exercise was last week? Anybody remember? We were supposed to read something. Okay, all right, go, go back and read Philippians this week, okay? It's a short book of the Bible. It's like four chapters, not long. All right, so go back and read it this week. I I followed this whole training exercise. I read it in the context of this reading from Acts 16 this week. I found time and again confirmation and evidence of the spirit of joy that was found in this church. We read in Philippians, Paul writing to them from prison. I thank my God every time I remember you constantly praying with joy in my prayers for all of you because of your sharing of the gospel from the first day until now. I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. If there's any encouragement in Christ, Paul writes, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, in the spirit any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. And later in Philippians, Paul writes, Welcome Timothy in the Lord with all joy. Joy that was present in Lydia's first church of Philippi. And then we get to some of the most beautiful words in Scripture, at least to me. Uh, Words that I go back to all the time in Philippians chapter 4. And I want to invite us to read this together. Words of Paul, uh, later written to First Church Philippi and Pastor Lydia. So let's read this together. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. There we go. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. So what did you hear in that reading from Philippians? And just, just give me one word. Just throw it out. Just yell it out. What, what did you hear in that? I heard peace, joy. What did you hear in that? What's that? Faith. Yeah. Yeah, peace, joy, faith, hope, right? And there's something amazing about being dazzled, amazed, surprised by the work of God in our midst. It does lead to all those things, right? When we're able to see the presence and activity of God all around us, it leads to joy and all those characteristics. And I think what Paul is is writing here really reflects what Mary Oliver wrote in her prayer 
But it must be a great disappointment to God if we're not dazzled at least 10 times a day by, by what we see in our midst, by the, the presence and activity of God all around us. Because when we rejoice in the Lord, we find joy in all things. When we, when we place the good and beautiful things of life in, in our hearts and minds, when we see the hope and joy and love of all creation, we'll be astonished and amazed and I believe we'll find joy in our midst. The late priest and spiritual author Henry Nouwen, who I go back to all the time, uh, wrote about this, this spirit of joy. He wrote, be surprised by joy. Be surprised by the little flower that shows its beauty in the midst of a barren desert. And be surprised by the immense healing that keeps bursting forth like springs of fresh water from the depth of our pain. If we're going to join Paul and his companions on this missionary journey, may we first find joy. Joy in even the simplest of things. Maybe a little flower, a simple smile, a beautiful baptism that we experienced in the first service this morning, or maybe even in, in a simple game of catch between meetings at the beginning of the day or at the end of the day. I have to tell you, in my, in my life, in, in response to the soul training exercise this week, I've been amazed and dazzled by God and so many volunteers down the street at Gleaners who have put up with humidity, heat, lightning, smoke from wildfires, rain, you name it. They've been out there every Monday this summer serving with joy and serving because they want to be a part of the community and do something good for the community. I've been amazing about, uh, by uh, some of our uh, guests at Gleaners, one in, in, in particular who comes to mind who, uh, who was waiting for food one Monday in the last several weeks and said, hey, are you that pastor playing catch? Yeah. Well, I want to help. And she handed me five bucks and said, I want this to go to the, to the campaign. Pretty amazing. And even in my individual games of, of catch, just having fun, finding joy in the simplest of things. And I have some uh, pictures up here of just a few of my catch partners. This is uh, Fred Glass, the CEO of Gleaners, um, a couple weeks ago. We go to the next one. That's, uh, everybody knows Lou, of course. She was singing in the choir this morning. Bishop Trimble, who uh, was the bishop of our Indiana conference, and wore his cubby gear. I didn't know he was a Cubs fan. Learn something new about your bishop every day. And here is a picture of my catch partners for today. Anybody recognize them? I was amazed, astonished, dazzled by God in the work of these two, and Evie and Carly, when they handed me just a few weeks ago an envelope with $43.50 from a lemonade stand that they put together to support the work of Gleaners. How amazing is that? Sometimes all we have to do is look at the simple things in life, to look at the people around us, to, to look at nature, to, to have a game of catch and, and just be amazed and dazzled by God. And then in response of that, share the good news of the gospel with joy on our hearts. Nowin continues by writing this. Each day holds a surprise, but only if we expect to hear it, to see it, to experience it. So let's not be afraid. Now in writes, let's not be afraid, whether it comes as, to us as joy or sorrow, to receive each day's surprise, each day's joy. So friends, whether we're in Philippi with First Church, in Jerusalem, Indianapolis, or anywhere in between, may we find joy and be dazzled by God in the simplest of things all around us. Let's pray together. Oh God, whose beauty is beyond our imagining and whose power we cannot comprehend, we are amazed by you amazed by your lights in the darkness, 
by your presence and power that's with us in even weakness, and your Holy Spirit that gives us life and breath every moment. So Lord, we meet you in this time and place. Humbled by your loving kindness, we bow before you. Overjoyed by your forgiveness, we give thanks to you. And so God, we meet you with gladness and joy. So may we live all of our days, God, being surprised and dazzled by you. For we pray this in the holy and precious name of Jesus, our Christ. Amen.